In this video, I'll introduce one of the most important formulas in all of finance, called the capital asset pricing model. I'll discuss the assumptions we make when we use this model, and then we'll use the model to predict stock returns. Finally, I'll mention the security market line, which is the graphical representation of the capital asset pricing model. So, as I've said already, the capital asset pricing model, or CAPM for short, is extremely important. This model uses beta to quantify the relationship between risk and return for different investments. You're looking at the model form of the CAPM right now. We use this form of the model to predict the expected return on a stock. To do this, we take the risk-free rate plus the stock's beta times the quantity of the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. The quantity of the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate is also referred to as the market risk premium. Now the market risk premium is the amount the market earns beyond the yield on the risk-free asset. The beta in this model is calculated using OLS regression. The beta can also be calculated as the covariance between the stock return and the market return divided by the variance on the market, aka the variance of the S&P 500. Alright, let's try a CFA question. So which of the following is most likely to have an expected return less than the risk-free rate? So this is just a refresher from our last video where I covered beta. You can have a, an asset with a beta of negative 0.25, beta with 0, or a beta with 0.25. Well, based on the CAPM, or the model form of the CAPM, whenever we have a positive beta, this means that, I mean, generally our market risk premium is going to be positive, so that's going to make this entire quantity positive. So what this means is, whenever we have a positive beta, our expected return on our stock is going to be equal to, well, it, something more than just our risk-free rate. So in this case, C would certainly not be correct. B, however, if beta is zero, then this entire thing is zero, and that means that our expected return on our stock is equal to our risk-free rate. So in this case, B is not correct either. The, the correct answer here is A. And the reason it's correct is because if we have a negative beta, that makes our, our quantity of our beta times our market risk premium almost certainly negative. I mean, investors expect a premium to hold a riskier asset than the risk-free rate. So they're expecting a positive return here. And if you have a negative beta, that makes this entire thing negative, and therefore your expected return would be your risk-free rate plus some negative value. I mean, that's what happens when you have a negative beta. So the answer here is A. Now, let's get a background on the CAPM. The CAPM is the equilibrium model that underlies all modern investment theory. It's closely tied to something called the fundamental pricing equation, but that's way beyond what we're covering here. Now, the CAPM was developed in the mid-1960s under the assumption that investors can build a diversified portfolio of securities using modern portfolio theory. It assumes that firm-specific or diversifiable risk can be diversified away or has already been diversified away. The CAPM was developed really by three different financial economists, William Sharp, Jack Trainer, and John Lintner and they're often the three given credit for developing the model. They each worked on the model separately, and then as a result, Sharp, William Sharp, and then Harry Markowitz were awarded the 1990 Nobel Prize in Economics, in part for their contributions to the development of this model and portfolio management in general. Now, the CAPM has many purposes. Since the model is used to calculate beta, and can predict stock returns, we use it in all kinds of valuation models and when we need to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Now the CAPM makes a number of assumptions. This list that I'm about to give you is by no means a complete list, but you should know these assumptions at the very least. First, the CAPM assumes that markets are efficient and information is priced. 
This means that investors respond to new information by immediately factoring it into the share price. News that indicates the cash flows of a stock will decline in the future should decrease the value of the stock. If markets are efficient, then bad news will be reflected by an immediate decrease in the share price. So that's what I mean when I say markets are efficient. They price in new information to the share price of a stock. Second, we assume that there are no taxes or transaction costs. Taxes and transaction costs create market distortions. Some investors might hold securities for longer than they otherwise would if the capital gains tax rate was lower than the short-term capital gains tax rate. Other investors might not buy or sell securities if the transaction costs were too high. Now, as you're probably aware, this assumption doesn't hold up in the real world. However, we need it to be true for the model to work. In the U.S. public equity market, taxes and transaction costs are lower than they are for other securities in other markets, which is at least somewhat satisfying. Now, the final assumption I, I need you guys to know is that the CAPM assumes all investors will have the same assets in which to invest. This means that every investor around the world must be able to buy and short any security. This allows them to make use of their information and ensures that the stock's market price can reflect its intrinsic value. In the real world, this assumption doesn't necessarily hold up. Investors in some countries are not allowed to invest in securities in other countries. For example, for a long time, U.S. investors have historically not been allowed to purchase Class A shares of Chinese securities or Chinese equities. Another example of investors not being able to invest in all assets occurs with mutual funds. Mutual funds are often only allowed to invest in stocks, bonds, and money market securities. Also, some investors are not allowed to short securities. So you can see that some of the assumptions of the CAPM don't necessarily hold up in the real world, but the model itself requires these assumptions to be true in order for us to be able to effectively use the model or for us to be able to say that the model accounts for all of the variation in our stock's return. All right, let's try another CFA level one question. So in this example, I'm going to ask you to actually calculate the expected stock return for a given security. So given that the expected market risk return is 7% and the risk-free rate is 2.5%, what is the expected return for Daniel's security? And we have three investors here with different standard deviations and different betas. Uh, so notice here a couple of things. Uh, first off, we're given a market risk return of 7%. Now this is a little unusual. I mean, most investment professionals will, will refer to this as just the return on the market. Uh, the CFA in this question, uh, I didn't write this question. They, they specifically refer to it as the market risk return, uh, but this is just the return on the market, R sub M. A risk-free rate, so this is probably the yield on a T-bill or a T-note or a T-bond or whatever we're defining as our risk-free rate here. All right, so let's go through and actually calculate the expected return on Daniel's security using the CAPM. All right, so I've just copied over the formula, or rather the, the data and the formula, over into Excel. So let's go ahead and work this problem in Excel. So we're trying to calculate the expected return on Daniel's stock, and to do that, we're going to use the CAPM. So in this problem, if you recall, our risk-free rate was 2.5%. And so to calculate the expected return on Daniel stock, or the expected return on stock I in this case, what we'll do is we'll add up the 2.5% risk-free rate, and then we're going to add in our beta, in this case Daniel's beta is 1.6, times the market risk premium. And remember, the market risk premium is just everything inside these parentheses. It's just the expected return on the market, or as it's referred to in this problem, the market risk return of 7% minus the risk-free rate of 2.5%. So I'll close my parentheses, both of them, hit enter, and in this case, Daniel's return is expected to be 9.7%. So in this case, 
The answer here is B. All right, last but not least, let's talk about the security market line. Now, the security market line graphically shows the expected return of any security given its beta. It's essentially the picture of the cap M. So let's go through this. Uh, so on the y-axis here, we have the expected, or as it's sometimes known, the required return. Uh, it's So the expected return on a stock is sometimes referred to as the required return uh, because from an investor's perspective, they're requiring a specific return in order to hold this stock or invest in this stock. Now the x-axis here is the beta. Uh, so the higher the beta, the higher the expected return because you have, in order to hold a very risky stock like JCPenney or any airline stock, you're going to, as an investor, demand a higher return to compensate you for that, that larger amount of undiversifiable risk. So the security market line is the line drawn from the risk-free rate, which is down here at 2% with z a beta of zero, and goes up like so, and the slope of this security market line is equal to the market risk premium. So if the market risk premium here is, oh, let's say six or 6%, uh, yeah, so the the security, that's the slope of the this line here. Uh, so that's that. I mean, if you wanna know how much you're expected to earn on a specific stock, all you need to do is know that stock's beta and the risk-free rate, and you can get a sense of your expected or required return on that stock. So for example, if we had one of those stocks from earlier, any of them that has a beta of around 1.5, uh, your required return would be somewhere around here, about, well, 10 or 10.5-ish. So that's that. I mean, pretty straightforward. All right, now let's recap what we covered. So the cap M indicates that the expected or required return on a stock is determined by its beta, the market risk premium, and the risk-free rate. Now the cap M, it's used for a number of different areas of finance. Uh, we use it in valuation work. We'll use it here in a couple of videos where we start to calculate the uh, intrinsic value of various securities. We use it to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Uh, we just used it to calculate or predict stock returns. It's used for a number of different reasons, and it is really our seminal model for predicting stock returns. It's the original. There are other models that are arguably empirically better, but for our purposes, I mean, the CAPM is really the one return prediction model that is far and away more important than all of them. And then finally, I mentioned the security market line or SML. And the security market line, as I've said a couple of times already, that is just the graphical representation of the capital asset pricing model. It starts down at the risk-free rate and has the slope equal to the market risk premium. And it tells us for a given beta, what is your expected or required return? And so with that, I'm gonna wrap up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I will see you on the next video.